So there's a checkpoint there where the cells are like, are all my chromosomes lined up? You know, the answer is no. Normal cells say, okay, let me wait until everything is repaired, and then I can proceed. Cancer cells don't care about those checkpoints, and typically they get rid of those checkpoints. And so they don't worry if their chromosomes are lined up. They don't worry about this DNA damage. They can continue in that, in the absence of it. So what happens with those two things, it's like driving a car. The green, the growth signals, is the gas cut. And so mutations in the cell that result in, in you know, the self-sufficiency will put the gas down the car wants to go. But remember, normal cells have that brake, which wants the cell to stop. If you get rid of those anti-growth signals, and that class of genes are called tumor suppressors, which makes sense, they're going to suppress tumor growth. If you remove those tumor suppressors, you take the brake off, and then the car is going to go forward, sort of analogy for tumor growth. So those are two aspects. <clears throat> Another one is evading apoptosis, which is cell death. What happens with a normal cell, if it can't repair damage or it can't control where its chromosomes are, it'll go through what's called programmed cell death, and it will undergo this very tidy start of a suicide, so to speak. Cancer cells don't do that. They can ignore that and continue to grow in the absence of, you know, of the, the apoptosis. Another one is sustained angiogenesis. You know, tumors start as one cell or multiple cells, and they continue to grow, right? They develop volume. What happens with us in our normal bodies? We need vasculature, right? We need arteries, veins, capillaries to provide the oxygen, remove the waste product to provide glucose. So what happens with tumors is that they can promote their own vascularization or angiogenesis to develop the arteries and veins to vascularize the tumor. And they provide their own signals that allows them to get the oxygen and the nutrients uh, as part of, of growth. The other aspect, which is part of the HeLa story, is what's called limitless replicative uh, potential. Normal cells only grow in culture for a defined period of time. Typically, we call them passages and doublings. Normal cells will eventually stop growing, and it's called senescence. And then that's it. And they're not going to do anything more in dish. Whereas cancer cells continue to grow. As so I'll show you a picture of a chromosome, we'll come back and we'll refer back to that aspect. And lastly, in purple, tissue invasion and metastasis. Eventually, late stage cancers leave the initial site of the primary uh, focus of the cancer and they can migrate and move to, through the lymph nodes and through other uh, tissues, and that's called metastasis. So, those are the seven main hallmarks. The new review has more, but for general purposes, this will give you a kind of a broad idea of what's different with the cancer cell versus the transformed or uh, normal cell. Just quickly, typically when we think of cancer, we always think of it as a progression. If you unfortunately are familiar with cancer, there's stages of cancer, there's early stages, stage one or so through stage four typically. Later stage or more aggressive cancer is typically the metastatic form that has you know, invaded tissue and migrated to parts of the body. I picked this, progression of cervical disease after HP, HPV infection, and this is what killed Henrietta Lacks. She had cervical carcinoma. She had a human papillomavirus infection. Unfortunately, the HPV that infected her cervix was the oncogenic form or the cancer-causing form, which, which caused the tumor. So initially, you have what's called normal epithelium that's part of the cervix upon viral infection. That virus contains proteins that go into the cells of the cervix, alter the signaling, alter the checkpoints that we just talked about, and these viral proteins actually can transform the cell to cause this tumor progression. So it's not you know, the genetics per se, or it's not an environmental insult, it's the actual viral infection and viral proteins that can trigger um, this cancer, not for all infections, but for some. But what happens in over a time of months per year. There can be a gradual progression, additional mutations, because remember, we talked about these checkpoints, and normal cells want to be very careful, and every time they divide, they want to make two identical daughter cells from the mother cell, and so on. But with these, as you start to lose checkpoints, you can accumulate damage, as I'll show you. The actual chromosomes in the HeLa cell, there's more than normal. They accumulate chromosomes, you get more genetic problems with the cell that can lead to more issues. And what eventually can happen in, in cervical uh, carcinoma, it progresses through multiple stages, and then eventually, as you see, an invasive carcinoma. It can leave the cervix, it can invade into the, um, the ovaries, the bladder. If you remember from the book or online, there's an autopsy where basically the metastasis throughout the peritoneal cavity 
as the tumor spread. And that's the invasive aspect, which is the last stage of the cancer. So, I have a little idea about cancer cells, a little idea about cervical carcinoma. So 51 was when the cells were biopsied from Henrietta and George and without taming the sample was able to grow them. We'll talk about that in a bit. What we have here, this is from a, a magazine, Wired magazine, describing the significance of these cells for biomedical research. And there are a variety of different cells. He was on top, and there's mouse cells and a variety of green monkey cells. This one right here, Jerkat, 14-year-old boy. Those are from a T cell lymphoma. We just used these in immunology a couple weeks ago, so we have these kinds of cells as well that, that students do. So at the time in 2010, there were over 60,000 publications that had HeLa in them. So effectively, there's a PubMed database, which is for all biomedical literature, and you can, there's a search box, and you can type in HeLa, and you pull out 60,000. I just did it this week, and it's up to almost uh, 70,500 uh, publications just uh, with HeLa. I forgot this, but I actually have a HeLa paper. I had to go look this weekend. It was this, this from 1990s. I forgot. It was a while. But it's from a paper that I did when I was in California, San Francisco on an HIV project. And uh, as part of the paper in the methods, we actually used HeLa cells to study gene expression. We weren't studying cervical carcinoma, we weren't studying HeLa cells. We we're effectively using them as a cellular test tube, so to speak, because they had all the proteins and machinery that was able to help us study what we were doing, which is basic transcription, how the genes get expressed. But that was one of the 70,000. So what we also have, and this is hard to see, but I'll go through it a little bit, a timeline from 1951, the biopsy. At that point, a lot of researchers were taking cells from biopsies, trying to grow them in culture, trying to keep them growing and develop them to no avail. There's some aspect of her cells with a viral infection and the way the cells work, they were the first cell able to grow outside the body, able to grow in culture. Remember from the book, there's the pictures of the they're developing the media and making um, the media and the types of class. I have a little show and tell that you're welcome to after the talk. In terms of basically, they utilize glass or plastic where, as we'll tell you a little bit, these cells actually grow on plastic, and these are the kinds of you know, containers that one uses even back then. And I'll also. Uh, describe the media. This is media actually made from 1959 that we still use. And I provided you a little recipe if you want to check check later. And we have um, refrigerators full of these medias. Nowadays, for any particular cell type, there are very specific medias that are important for the work. But even in 1952, um, poliovirus. They were using the HeLa cell because they can infect the HeLa cell with polio virus, and through that work they're able to develop the polio vaccine. So even within the first couple of years of having the cells available, the polio vaccine was able to be discovered as a result of the cells. Also, live cell transport. The ability to take cells, freeze them down, follow them in another location, and utilize them. And with George Gay, he was able, free of charge, to take the cells anywhere. He usually fly with them, or he had people put them in their pocket because it was warm to distribute them to other researchers, not only in the United States, but around the world as well. So having a cell line to study to how they can grow, how you can freeze them, how you can thaw them, was really important to disseminate lines like this and future lines for, for, for research purposes. And so that was incredibly important. Unfortunately, 1954, it's for-profit distribution of cells, and that's one of the big issues with the book and that for the longest time the Lax family didn't even know what the cells were there and they haven't profited from you know, the cells as many other companies have in, in, in the future. This is actually the first paper, as I found it as a, as a PDF today. 1953, we have George uh, Gay, studies on the propagation in vitro of the poliomyelitis viruses. So this was the first time they were able to take these cells grow them, infect them with polio virus, show that the virus could alter the cells. And, and they also were able to show how they grew the cells. I just want to quickly, so they were using either human placental serum, human adult serum, or human acidic fluid or chick embryonic extract. Anytime you grow cells, you're going to need a particular media, which basically is like a vitamin in liquid form. 
all the amino acids and vitamins and salts, but you also have to provide some growth factors. I described that cancer cells typically don't need particular growth factors, but they do need serum. They do need some growth factors to allow them to continue to grow in culture. In this case, they utilize adult serum from a variety of sources. Nowadays, typically, we use what's called a fetal bovine serum or, or from, from the cow or horse serum or goat serum. You always have to maintain serum in addition you know, to, the, to the media that, that's utilized. So the growth conditions haven't changed very much. That bottle of media was formulated in 1959. That recipe hasn't changed. There's other medias as well, but this foundational research that was done in the 50s still carries on as a virtue of you know, being able to use uh, the helo line. Helos were also important for studying what's called a karyotype, which is common practice now. You take a cell and you can condense the chromatin through the cell cycle and you can examine the chromosomes, how many there are, you can look at to see whether someone, you know, the sex of the person, whether that's XXY. If someone has a cancer or a particular disease, you can study the karyotype and determine uh, what might be, around, what might be uh, wrong chromosomally. If a, a child is born amniocentesis, you can look at different chromosomal abnormalities like Down syndrome. So the chromosome karyotype is very important. This is actually a normal karyotype where you have 22 what are called autosomal chromosomes. We're diploid, so there's two each, one from mom, one from dad. And this sample is female, so there's two copies of the X chromosome. So that's normal. Two copies of every chromosome, 1 through 22, and XX for female. If you look at the HeLa cells, these are derived from what's called HeLa Ohio. That's one thing that's not described in the book. A big part of the book, right, was the contamination issue. HeLa's grow so well, and if your techniques aren't completely clean, HeLa cells can contaminate some other cell line you're using. And when you think you're using, you know, a ovarian cancer line or a lung cancer line, if you had HeLa cells in your lab, those HeLa cells can contaminate those other cultures. They grow faster. And next thing you know, you're not studying the cell type. And there was a, a, quite a few sections in the book that described it, right? And that was a big problem. It can still be a big problem. The other issue that comes up, which is what we faced when we were doing research, not every HeLa cell is the same. It's called HeLa. But if you really go in and look, this says HeLa Ohio, and there's HeLa S3. There's all these now subclones of HeLa. Someone can have HeLa cells in Rhode Island. Somebody can have HeLa cells in California, but if they've been grown for the longest time, they'll accumulate their own mutations, right? Because that's what cancer cells do. They'll start to get other changes, and in fact, even though they're called HeLa, they're not necessarily the identical HeLa line. And that's happened a lot in research, where somebody will publish, hey, I got this great finding in my HeLa cells. Another lab will try to repeat the same experiment with their HeLa cells, but they're not the identical HeLa cells. They're not able to repeat the work. So that's another issue that's not in the book, but that comes up in the biomedical field, so you've got to be really careful with HeLa cells, not just for contamination of what you're using, but what kind of HeLa cells you're using because of the fact that they can diversify uh, over time. But you can see here, there's four copies of 12, there's a couple extra of one of some of these copies, the chromosomes kind of um, translocated and did weird things to go, there's extra copies down here, there's only one copy of 22, and so, this is what's called an antipoid. As these cells don't have these checkpoints, right, and you want to be really careful when you divide or they're sloppy, you start to develop extra chromosomes, and you start to develop these abnormalities that occur. And this is an example of using the HeLa cell line. So now through the 70s and through today, uh, 1984 HPD, Harold uh, Zonkhausen, who won the Nobel Prize in, uh, in 08, had utilized HeLa cells and was studying HPD, human papilloma virus. As a result of this, was one of the researchers able to show HPD can cause cervical carcinoma, won the Nobel Prize as, as you know, for part of his research just recently, and had utilized HeLa cells. Also, in 1989, we'll get back to this, this is um, research, researchers are able to, to look at normal chromosomes. You see how they're linear? They're not circular. At the very end of every chromosome, there's a very special structure called a telomere that's absolutely required for the chromosomes to be normal. If they don't have that, they get to stick together and you get weird things happening. There's an enzyme called telomerase, and part of the story with HeLa cells is that the enzyme is able to be identified 
through utilization of HeLa cells, and the Nobel Prize is awarded as well for studying telomerase by virtue of using HeLa cells. So there's at least five Nobel Prizes that at some point during those projects had utilized HeLa cells as part of what, of what they've done. So you can see, once again, the impact that these cells have had on biomedical research. One thing we'll also talk about is ethics, and we'll get back and talk about a little bit about the history of ethics and, and clinical trials, because obviously that's such a huge part of the book and a lot of changes have occurred since uh, the 50s. If you want to buy your own HeLa cells, uh, or you can ask me, I can give you some. But this is from the American Type Culture uh, Collection, and that was referred to in the book. It's a nonprofit group. They have thousands and thousands of cell lines, bacterial lines, uh, fungal lines. We utilize ATC quite a bit. We need to obtain a cell line for, for our purposes. This is actually, I, I took today, this is the HeLa cells that they have, the, the original clone, um, homo sapiens, adherent, epithelial, up there, hard to see, but nonprofit, you can buy them for $359, and if you're for profit, like pharmaceutical companies, it's over $400. Uh, dollars. So this is a nonprofit organization. They take the funds and then utilize them to maintain the cells and ship them to places. But there's a lot of other companies like Invitrogen and others that use HeLa lines that was described in the book. And I look today, they have prices ranging from 100 to well over $10,000 for a particular cell line derived from the initial HeLa that obviously the Lax family doesn't get profits for, the company does. But, so I just wanted to mention that briefly. So a little bit about guidelines for human research. Nuremberg Code was 1949, after World War II, right, the Nazi experimentation. There was the uh, essential voluntary <coughs> consent for working with human subjects. Uh, 1964, it was uh, Helsinki Declaration, consent if at all possible with human subjects. The last uh, three are from the United States. One called the National Research Act, if you remember the Tuskegee experiments with um, African American males and syphilis, not telling them they had syphilis, looking at progression of the disease that went on in the 30s, 40s, through the 70s. So in response to that, the National Research Act occurred. And in 1978 was the initial aspect of IRB, Institutional Review Boards, that monitor human subject research that are in place. And we've had one in place now for three or four years, formally. Is that that would be sure, yeah, yeah, three years. Before that, we had one in yeah. terms of federal insurance. In addition, then, there was a Belmont report. And finally, in 1991, the United States government officially had this <coughs> Title 45 in terms of the formal regulations in place to do research on human subjects, whether it's for clinical trials or academic research as such. I briefly want to show you um, I'm not on this board, and you'll see why I'm happy on that. Uh, there's a lot of charts and there's a lot of very important regulations and, and rules for this. This is chart one out of 11 that describes the type of research and whether research is exempt. Uh, Mary O'Keefe is currently the chair of the IRB and I'm literally one or two times a semester I will contact her and ask her questions about things we're doing in the laboratories, research laboratories, teaching laboratories, so, and other departments as well. So this is an ongoing issue. And it doesn't have to be about medical experimentation. It could be education or um, research or business research. Anytime you're working with humans, there's always a possibility. I didn't promise her I'd do a shout out for the IRB, but um, you know, they're, they're, it's on campus and it's something that we're always aware of since it's federally uh, regulated. So that was a little background. So for me, as I said, I've been doing cancer research since the late 80s. And I've had a lot of experience both with cancer lines in general and with HeLa, uh, as I described. Cell culture I've done quite a bit, UVA, as I said, University of Virginia. And what happened, I wanted to read you a couple things from the book that actually kind of hit home. I forgot my reading glasses. Oh, right. So this is about uh, Rebecca describing when I, first got, when I got my first computer in the mid-90s and started using the internet, I searched for information about her but found only a few snippets. Most sites said her name was Helen Lane. Some said she died in her 30s, others said the 40s, 50s, or even 60s. Some said ovarian cancer had killed her. Others said breast or cervical cancer. So it's the 90s, and students in the audience, we didn't really have the internet back then. <laughs> or we had computers, so we had that going on. Uh, we had the internet, but we had to learn how to, how to use Unix, and so I had to learn Unix for a lot of my research. But when I got the HeLa cells, there were a couple of things that struck me at first. Oh, I feel like we're being that kind. 
Now, if you're in a fast, that's last typically. First thing that I struck at, when I work with leukemia cells, you know, your blood cells are circulating, right? They're traveling through your blood and through your body. When we grow leukemia cells, they grow in suspension because they're part of the blood and they don't stick and they're really easy to work with and dilute and grow. HeLa cells, as you might imagine from the little picture I showed you right before that are in here, they stick to the plastic or to the glass because they're epithelial. They usually line up together and, and they're what are called in here. So the first thing I noticed, which kind of ticked me off, is that they were a lot harder to work with because they stick to the plastic and you just can't take them out and use them. Um, right, Dave, when you're using your cells? Yeah. We usually had to use like a scraper, mechanically scrape them or digest them off. So that, that kind of ticked me off at first because of the aspect is a lot harder to use. But the one thing that really struck me was that I was usually using mouse cells, because that was what my research was in. I mean, cell development in a mouse. It was the first time I got human cells, which was, it was like at first blew me away. It's like, wow, when I have human cells here, and they were called HeLa cells, and I remember asking somebody, it was my boss or another student, like, you know, HeLa, what does it mean? And she said, Helen Lane. And so I said, okay, that's fine. And what kind of cancer? Breast cancer. So when I read that in the book, I'm like, I won't swear for the video. It's like, you know, what happened to me? You know, they were now only in breast cancer cells, and now they're not. So, you know, that was part that was interesting to me because that, that happened while I was doing research. Um, the other thing that happened is that I was actually a blood cell donor as well. I worked in the immunology department, and I worked next to a T cell lab that studied the human T cells in the response to, to the flu. So, they went by all the different labs and asked what everybody's tissue type was, and they took our blood. I fortunately was the exact genetic match for what they wanted for their flu virus. And I don't ever remember signing something, maybe I did. But every week they would literally um, leave me in the lab, med students or MDs, not grad students, to take blood from me, use my cells for their research, freeze them down. Eventually they did a whole unit of blood and they utilized it for research. So somewhere at UVA, they have my cells that are primed against the flu. So if there is a big flu pandemic, I'm getting in the car and <laughs> driving down. <laughs> if anybody wants to write a book about the immortal life of me, <laughs> I'm thinking of Zac Efron playing me as Greg. <laughs> maybe Clooney, maybe Clooney, but I'm worried that the problems probably runs the budget, probably Charlie Sheen, Danny <laughs> <laughs> so just keep that in mind about blood cell donor. And then I went to uh, University of California, San Francisco, I worked in two different labs. One was a cancer lab studying the metabolism of cancer cells, which I did in yeast. And the first one was in an immunodeficiency lab, where we either studied congenital immunodeficiency, so we had uh, cells from patients, typically from Europe, or HIV was the other half, which, which I worked a little bit on. So we did quite a bit of work with um, human cells uh, there. Um, a little bit with HeLa cells as well, especially with my first postdoc, and we saw the paper that I did, that was from my first lab when I was doing uh, immunodeficiency. But even here at Providence College, and I actually want to show you a picture from 2006. These are HeLa cells that students grew here in culture, and um, it was an interesting story when I got these. These aren't normal HeLa cells. What happens a lot with HeLa cells is that you can introduce other genes or other things to make them useful for your research. In fact, what this line has is part of the HIV virus linked up to an enzyme called beta-galactosidase. And when beta-galactosidase is expressed, it can turn the cell blue. So we use these to kind of mimic an HIV infection without using the virus to ask what's important for cells to have an activated virus. Because in viral infections, oftentimes the virus is silent, and it takes something to activate the virus to start the viremia. And the disease. So we were able to sort of do this in HeLa cells, which is a, a, a nice thing. But in order to get these cells, or in order to get HeLa cells from other companies, you have to fill out what's called an MTA, or a material transfer agreement, such that the company giving you the cells and the people receiving them, you're not going to use them for purposes other than what you intend them for. And I remember when I was filling out the agreement, and I sent it to the legal office here, I'm like, there's no way it's going to pass. We're going to see HIV and they're going to see cells in DNA and they're going to be like, no, 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 no. But it was fine. I didn't have any problems with it. But, um, so my students used HeLa cells. They grew them in culture and we had some great results and that was in my immunology class. So in terms of here, in terms of what research is happening on campus for uh, cancer research, 
we got Father Asriaco, Father Nick. He just he does yeast models of cell growth and, 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 and cell death. All these genes that are involved in cell growth that I described earlier on, they get mutated or changed and are involved also in, in program cell death. They're so fundamental to life, they're so fundamental to growth that even if they're human genes, there are similar genes in yeast. So one can study cell growth and death in yeast, which will be very similar to what happens in human cells. And so by studying yeast, which are easier to use, cheaper, you can manipulate them easier. You can learn a lot about cancer. You can learn a lot about cell growth and death in yeast models. And Father Nick has a very successful lab doing that. He's also teaching a genetics course now. And he also has a cancer course, which used to be a seminar. He's going to convert it into a full-blown course and usually offers that every year or every other um, year. Yenxing Wan is also utilizing uh, skin and ovarian cancers, typically. Um, what, you have lines still growing, Dave? What are you? Uh, what? Yeah, we actually uh, we have just regular um, melanocytes, just regular skin cells, as well as uh, melanomas, uh, melanoma cells. And we just finished the uh, ovarian cancer cell line, so uh, we're closing up shop for the summer. So. And so we, uh, what uh, they do in, in the Wan lab is study how external stimuli, whether it's UV radiation for cells, alters the signal, because that was one thing you described the growth signal, right? They signal the cell to grow or to not grow, and Dr. Weinstein is, is doing great things about how cells respond to these growth factors or signals, both normal cells and cancer cells, and he himself has, has a cell signaling course which examines cancer cells and how they signal. For my work, I study the genetics of leukemia cell differentiation, and I'm hopefully finishing up that project. This is in mouse leukemia cells. That was what I used as well in graduate school. And I also have a um, research looking at blood cell development using human uh, stem cells, uh, adult stem cells, so these pluripotent stem cells. Because for me, it's important to study how normal cells grow up normal blood cells. But if you can do that, then you can understand how leukemia cells are abnormal blood cells uh, grow. And then I teach immunology, as you saw with this picture as well, which you can utilize uh, those cells. Next, what uh, Jeff Market and others are going to do next year, hopefully, is actually incorporate HeLa cells into our Biology 103 lab. We're going to meet in a couple of weeks. And not only will students in 103 read the book, ask the summer and discuss it, we're actually going to have a couple of hands-on experiments. We can get some funding. It's <laughs> <laughs> really expensive media. But we're hoping to incorporate that so it's not just reading the book. Let's use those cells. Let's maybe do a karyotype. Look for the virus. Do some really cool things so the students get some direct hands on experience with you. Use the expertise we have in the department. So we're really excited about setting up something. Are you excited, Joe? Excited. <laughs> and so that's it. I wanted to thank CTE and the reading program. Thanks for listening. That's my contact information and um, time wise I'm sure I know our book groups. I and we've got questions as well. Yeah, we have a couple of uh, book groups going on through the CTE and we've started our conversations. I know not all of you are in those book groups, but I know uh, some of our members may have questions and also anyone else in the audience. But um, thank you very oh, much. Oh, it's my pleasure. Environmental insults, you know, as I said, UV radiation, 
that nice crunchy charred crust on a steak or a hamburger. Through the process of the grilling, I'm probably blowing everybody's memorial. Through the process of grilling, you're developing through chemistry these hydrocarbons that can attack the DNA. So you can develop mutations. I'm sorry. It's still good. But you can accumulate mutations as like that. As well, all are in the case of cervical cancer, it's a viral infection from HPV. Not all HPVs. I mean, there's multiple strains, and there's only certain strains of HP, HPV that are oncogenic. Unfortunately for Henrietta Lack, she was infected with the oncogenic strain, which, you know, which caused the progression. Yeah. This is a little off topic, but then how does, does your immune system have any role in all of this? Like, can it shut down some of these mutations? You should have taken the my immunology class. That's what we're doing this week. So okay. uh, the main part of what I do in immunology is not just how the immune system works, but we spend the last part of it looking at the, the clinical aspects of immunology. For the last four lectures, including tomorrow, hopefully the seniors will, will show up, we do tumor immunology. Yes, our immune system can recognize tumors. The funny thing is, it's self, right? It's not like you're infected with a bacteria or a virus and the immune system knows, hey, you're foreign, you're not self. It's self, but through the process of the tumor forming, you develop what are called tumor antigens. Maybe it's a mutated protein, maybe it's a viral protein, or something overexpressed. So you have these tumor antigens that the immune system can recognize and kill off. Tumor cells, though, are very good at blocking or invading the immune system or shutting it off. So they can kind of turn off the immune system, allow themselves to grow and develop, even though the immune system is trying to fight them off. Uh, with cells, cancer cells mutating all the time, it's very easy for them to escape the immune system and continue to grow. Uh, we started yesterday, we're gonna to finish tomorrow. There are a variety now of what are called tumor vaccines that you can literally take a cancer patient, in this case we're looking at prostate cancer, you can take cell, blood cells out of the patient, inject them with particular proteins that are related to the prostate cancer, put those back into the patient, kind of boost up the immune system, which can then, those cells can, can fight the tumor. So normally, the immune system is kind of shut down and you have to do some kind of intervention clinically to promote tumor vaccines. And there are a lot of ones that are already approved and there's a lot of research that's in the pipeline that's, that's happening that tends to usually uh, increase uh, survival and oftentimes slow down um, tumor progression, for sure. Okay. Um, two questions. One off of that one is, the difference between a malignant and benign tumor, is a benign one a tumor that's, that's been affected by the immune system? Uh, typically, it's, no, they're, they're typically benign, <coughs> encapsulated, they tend not to spread, they tend not to be aggressive. The and my, my more important question is, in HeLa cells, where they're constantly open to mutation, mm -hmm. How in the world do you control for that in the lab? Um, Cannabis. Don't. I mean, that's the problem with any. Uh, I'll make a confession. My graduate work was all on um, mouse leukemia cells, like 7 B cells. When you look in the normal cells that are equivalent, it's a different story. So that's one of the aspects and the caveats of doing work in cancer cells. They're cancer cells, right? There's something wrong with them. So you can study something in them, but nowadays, you have to go back and look at normal cells. And as I remember, I described how normal cells don't grow forever. You know, they stop growing, maybe just senescent. So that was always the issue before, that you can only use cells for so long. And you, and, you know, human cells, we just talked about an institutional review board and being very careful for consent. You just can't ask your undergraduates, can I have a skin sample to grow up in, in the laboratory? Uh, typically, the easiest way to get human cells is that you go down to the nursery and you get porcelain. That's the only easy way to get cells because there's certain decisions going on, right? And the infant, you know, the parents obviously get consent for, for the, the procedure, not the infant, but that's typically the way to get normal cells. Nowadays, as I described with my work, we use stem cells. So one can use stem cells. Since they're pluripotent, they continue to grow. They have that enzyme called telomerase, and so it's a lot easier now to study normal cells. But that's always a caveat with cells because they can accumulate, and that's why I said before, somebody's HeLa cell may right. be different from somebody else's, and so that was always a concern. Sure, that's always an issue. It's back in the 80s and 90s, when people were initially doing everything in cancer cells and using normal cells, they were like, oh wow, it's, not, it's different than your normal cells are different. But that's always a concern. And that was always a question people asked all the time in committee meetings or at seminars. Somebody would raise their hand and say, well, 
you know, does this happen in normal cells? And that was all sort of the question we all was asking. Has any scientist succeeded in growing uh, cells that do the same thing as in human cells? There are other lines that are similar to human cells that are cervical carcinoma lines that are similarly in, you know, infected with HPV. And for some reason, her cells at the time in the 50s were had the right mutations and had the right, you know, it just happened to be fortuitous for the researchers in that biopsy to happen. Um, nowadays, with being able to better understand how cells grow, partly what happened as, um, with her cells is that it was easier and we were better able to grow. They were better able to grow cells because of the fact of what they could learn from her cells. So it just so happened her cells had whatever mutations that allowed them to grow in the flask with whatever media they had. And I showed you what, you know, what the recipe was, so to speak. But yeah, there are other lines that are, that are out there that are, that are similar. It's funny you mentioned, um, you know, you go for a procedure and then the cells may be used mm -hmm. or something. So when someone gives consent for a procedure, are they necessarily giving consent for their cells to be studied? Depends on, I mean, typically what happens, and I was looking it up, what researchers can do if they get samples, if they code the samples or make them anonymous, then they're exempt from purposes. And so um, oftentimes that can happen depending on the studies. but. Uh, usually what happens in clinical trials and then they're kind of coded if you want to follow what's occurring with the patients and what's occurring at that point there's consent but yeah depending on how the tissues or the samples are treated and if they're then deemed anonymous and coded then they are pretty much fair game because you can't connect them back to the person that had them so um, that uh, can't, can't happen and anytime you read you know the consent form you know, there's a lot of fine print and you know with the IRBs there's a lot of very detailed regulations and rules that people have to follow uh, to do them. And that happened when I was in the labs when people had, uh, oftentimes for the immunodeficiency labs, a person would come in with a leukemia or a cancer and they would take out the cells of the cancer and researchers in the lab would take those and use them for purposes of research. But that was all previously consented to and would be utilized. We didn't know who the patients were. We just got samples from, you know, from the clinic. Any other questions? So you have my contact information, so anytime, feel free to email me, stop by, come by the lab, or, or call me if you've got other questions as, as you're reading the book. And I'm sure I might have to say a few words at other time. <laughs> but definitely in the fall, please come by the Den Bio Lab. We're going to do a lot of cool things with the dealer cells. I'm excited for the students to, to work with them directly. That's going to be a nice benefit uh, with, with the program. Thank you, everybody.